Hello, welcome to GTV Breakfast. This is the headline segment. Thank you for connecting with us. We hope you enjoyed everything that we prepared for you in the BFS kitchen. Chef Gabby and Valerie having a super swell time. I'll you with the news at 6 and also sports news at 7. Catch up on all that you've missed on our social media handles, GTV Ghana, everywhere. And help us to get to 1 million by December. It's possible and it begins with just one like. Share our content as well. This is a headline segment. We are sitting with two of our very favorite panel members, Sheikh Arami Yao Shaibu, spokesperson for the National Chief Imam. Salam alaikum, Sheikh. Alaykum, Welcome salam. once again. And Reverend Dr. Lawrence Setia, president and founder of the Worldwide Miracle Outreach. Welcome. Shalom. Shalom. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Reverend, welcome as well. Thank so, you. Two of our all time favorite panel members and lifetime patrons of GTV Breakfast, whether they like it or not, and they have liked it. Um, it's another Thursday, and you've joined us once again. I wonder what are on your minds this morning. What do you want to highlight, or what do you want to bring our attention to today? Should I start with Reverend? Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Tama, I read a news item yesterday that I felt very sad about. But before then, let me say a very good morning to you and say you're looking very good. Thank you. And it's good to see you. Thank you, Daddy. Okay. <laughs> and ha happy, happy holiday in advance for tomorrow. Founders yes, Day. Yes, yes, yes. Founders Day. Now, I read an article about how our cocoa beans have been smuggled to our neighboring countries. And the reason why they are being smuggled is because of lack of warehouses and good places to store the cocoa beans. And my question is that how reckless can Ghana be to forget that one of the pride we have in the world is our producers of cocoa, leading producers of cocoa. And we even take delight in competing with Ivory Coast as to who leads but if we are allowing our cocoa beans to be smuggled out in that manner, then certainly we are losing our place. And as a nation, we really have to learn to prioritize. I believe it is sad. It's a shame. It's unacceptable that we will get to that place where our cocoa beans are going to wrong hands. And it's of course, I'm noticing too that from the little reading I made, our cocoa farmers are not being taken care of. Meanwhile, we complain that our city is falling. So there are a lot of things that we don't prioritize. And because of that, we are losing what my big brother Sheikh would say, the durable dollar. <laughs> cocoa has really put Ghana on the map. In fact, some people call it cacao, some people call it cocoa, whatever name. But the beauty is that for those of us who travel around the world, when people meet you as a Ghana, apart from soccer, the next thing they want to talk about is Ghana cocoa. And if we cannot concentrate to build that segment, then I think we failed. And the farmers are not being treated well. And the kind of monies we use for other things, of course I'm not surprised that we are breaking and destroying the cocoa farms in place of Galapsi. So it does not benefit our nation. And I think that is one thing that I'm very concerned about. And so I'm not only appealing to the Ministry of Agri, but I'm calling on all stakeholders to make sure we don't destroy the very heritage we have. I think that by now, that the question will be turning in his grave, mm -hmm. that what God used him to bring to Ghana, remember the man was a blacksmith, he went all the way to Fernando Pon, brought this seed that has brought us a blessing to this nation. And I don't think we are doing very well. Prosperity will judge all of us. We are concentrating on many other things except the very thing that brought dignity to Ghana. I think we have to go back to a drawing board again. And in going back to a drawing board, we must also realize that if we don't handle these things well, in the next five, six, seven, ten, twenty years, we'll be losing our place. If we don't take care, Togo will even be overriding us. Because if you read the story 
from the voter region, from the tea region, and from other part of the region. In fact, even Burkina Faso is getting a cocoa beans. Ivory Coast is getting a cocoa beans. And Togo are becoming the biggest recipient of a cocoa beans. And, and if it is warehouse or lack of support for the farmers that is contributed to date, we must wake up. We must wake up. Good call, Reverend. Thank you for making that point for us. Sheikh, what's on your mind? Um, <clears throat> what has been on my mind since I, I participated in this, what I consider as one of the very novel um, conferences organized by a religious body in this country, and that is the Church of Pentecost, this idea of moral vision and national development that brought together participants close to 2,000 in one hall across the social spectrum. It attracted very, very eminent persons whose voices, whose mind, whose concern need to be brought to bear on this whole broad subject. The former president, His Excellency Ajisun Kufo was there, former president John Mahama was there, Chief Justice was there, Right Honorable Speaker of Parliament was there and all. And I had the privilege and the respect which the Church of Pentecost extended to me to be part of it and to also make a presentation. And I want to commend them highly uh, for that wisdom and that, that, that in, in, initiative. What caught my mind was the clear and unequivocal admission that our state is in a moral crisis. Mm -hmm. That was stated. Former President Jim Kufour did not mean his words. Indeed, former President Excellency John Muhammad did not mean his words. He even was said that he was envious of the Pentecost Church because he belongs to the Assemblies of God. He would have wished that it was his church that initiated, initiated this. And he, to use his own expression, that we've lost our moral compass. You know? And, you see, and I listened to a bit of certain discussions that was trying to becloud this whole very important discussion with the political coloration. And I got, I got worried. Because matters of morality is at the very heart of our humanity. What gives us humanity? Uh, it is not our physical makeup, which we share with the other infrahumans. We share with animals who, who you, you can see them in, in, in physical bodies. What makes us superior creatures among all creations of God uh, is the faith that we uphold and the morality that we express. And foreign morality has now become the very, the very factor that is eroding, eroding the accomplishments of yesteryears and making our development meaningless. I mean, can you, can you imagine what Reverend just me mentioned? That for once, one person's, one person's selfish inclination, uh, the whole of the nation must suffer. So they must carry our cocoa across the borders. For one person's, one person's greed, uh, our forest reserve must be destroyed to expose our water bodies to the, 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 the virtues of climate that we are losing our water. For somebody's greed, our water bodies must all be polluted. Let's all die and let him all, only one, survive. For somebody's greed, a public officer, officer takes money and, you know, cause poverty I mean, you can run it down, 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 down. I'm, I'm saying so, including, including even religious heads. Including religious heads. I mean, with all due respect, I have been, one of my main, main worries has been, for example, the Hajj the, 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 the Hajj organization, for, for example. I have been close to it, and I know lack of transparency, what people have personal interests. And I'm using this to demonstrate religion itself. So, so, that loss of moral authority, losing moral authority, in fact, across the social structures, 
from religion to family to corporate life to social life no more no more the obusu opinion who represented a moral authority within the family the teacher is no more a moral authority the priest and the imam is no more a moral authority and so there's a complete evanescence of our moral sense our community has become morally passive and morally apathetic insensitive and that is why you see the permissiveness of society we are breaking down seriously and so the future doesn't look good look how can somebody who is in charge gives a contract and we all know know it i don't have that but has become something that we have accepted the 10 percent charge on contract sale of contract so you do so and the contractor cannot have enough money and he does shoddy work having spent so much money he does the shoddy work so that after some time next government comes and that road gets deteriorated and we have to start it anew spending colossal sums of money i traveled to the, the, the u.s and it's so funny just recently look in this area that i was told is a village and i, I was surprised <laughs> <laughs> a village Town in the u.s yes uh, this is a village if, if a farming this thing wow look at the the, the roads then as we were driving i saw a signboard the warning us of rough road ahead that rough road, when I said, so, oh, so where's the rough road? <laughs> I asked myself, I asked the driver, mm. so is, is that the rough road you're talking about? In our country, this one is not a rough road. So what kind of people are we? What kind of people are we? Look, we are hurting our nation. We are deteriorating. And from regime to regime, can you, can you imagine that succeeding succeeding regimes will accuse the pres the, the, the the past the previous ones of corruption and when they come back there so so now the issue is oh you say i'm corrupt but you are more corrupt so the issue is not even we are eradicating but that we are even justifying okay the previous government was corrupt cor corrupt oh then they say okay but you are more corrupt so the issue is who is more corrupt and not dealing with the problem itself uh, it, it's becoming acceptable, a tradition among acceptable that we're not even worried about it. But I, okay, you accuse me, I'm corrupt. But I say you are more corrupt. So what is the common denominator? The common denominator is that we are all corrupt. And see how destructive corruption is dealing with us is visible for, 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 for us. We don't have to be scientific about it, about, about this one, but it's visible how we are destroying our nation. And so it's been a matter of concern for me, and I, I really applaud the pictures of Pentecost um, for the initiative. We have begun some discussions. We want to see wh where and where do we bring the minds, minds together so we can chart a certain what, I, what they have called moral vision, meaning that it's futuristic, meaning that we are worried about the moral, moral heritage we are bequeathing to younger generations, myself and Reverend, uh, we are advancing in age. Uh, I have crossed 65, meaning that I'm, got, I'm getting to 70. Uh, so what it means is that I'm growing. If I don't die, I'm growing. And I'm very, very, very particular about what le moral legacy I leave behind for my children. My children, in my family, what moral values will hold. So when I die and I'm gone, how do my children uphold the values that I uphold that has held my family together to this time? If I am responsible as a father and I don't do this, if I'm irresponsible as an imam, I don't do that. If I'm irresponsible as a minister, I don't do that. If I'm irresponsible as a teacher that I have been before, that I don't guide, I don't guide my students to moral rectitude, then what kind of heritage am, am, am I leaving behind? Look, our nation is hurting, and nobody should make politics of this. No one, and I urge everyone, politicians, please. You are all Christians, you are Muslims, you have been actively in the political forefront. Let us not make this one. For all other subjects of national dis discourse, we have made politics of it. For morality, you will exit politics, you will come to private life, and you see the result of the heritage you have left behind. And we live here to see. So please, 
I am worried, let's not make politics of this moral, moral, moral issue. We must turn the compass towards the direction of moral rectitude and solve our moral crisis so we can be counted among the top nations of the world whose examples can be learned. Thank you, Sheikh. I doubt there's anything we could add to that, but I saw the good Reverend just agreeing yeah. with much of what you, you were saying. Morality and the fact that we are in a moral crisis. I, I picked so many key points from this. I think I'll just replay it on social media, make some more points as well. If you're following us across our social media platforms, GTV Ghana, leave your thoughts on our post and we'll read a few of them as and when time allows us. Our WhatsApp number is also 055 What do you think? Reverend is concerned about cocoa smuggling and the lack of care and attention being given to cocoa farmers. Also, with the issue of illegal mining, which is causing a, a great, great um, harm to our cocoa industry. Rev has talked about the National Development Conference, which happened last week, and the fact that we are slowly falling off the scale when it comes to our moral values as a country. Thank you, Reverend. And please, Sheikh. please, 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 let me not kill this moral issue. My biggest fear for us in Ghana now is that as successful as the program went, people went there to be more of talkers than people who believe in what they spoke about. The idea that was moted by the leadership of the Church of Pentecost, of course, my good brother and friend, uh, Apostle Eric Nyamichel, mm -hmm. was super. He needed to be awarded, in fact, for that. But the question is that the speakers we had, did they go politically or they understood what they were talking about? I believe that like the Bible say we should not be talkers alone and hearers alone, but we should be able to act on what we hear. It looks as if what we are seeing now as a nation, I agree with Sheikh, hundred percent, maybe one million percent, that we should learn to walk the talk. And most time we try to be very eloquent. Most of the speakers were very eloquent about the very thing they were guilty about. The very thing that most of them have participated. Look at the spectrum of the speakers. Everybody wanted to be politically right. And so they please the people. It's like a preacher or a, 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 a cleric, an imam, who is going to preach and go on the net and Google some subjects and speaks it nicely. People are talking about the very things they do. And sometimes you look at people's lifestyle and what they speak about, and there are two different things. We must walk the talk. The issue of morality is eating into the fiber of this nation. When we were young, Thelma, when you sit in the bus and you see an elderly person, get up. you get up and they sit down. Mm -hmm. Today, our children, the children know they are right. I've gotten out of planes, you sit in a coach, you see an old lady who is struggling, and a young lady sit down and cross the leg, and normally rather put their hand around their boyfriend, foolishly cuddling the boy, when an older person is standing. And we don't know how to extend curtsies, and it's destroying the beauty of the Ghanaian culture and tradition we have. We seem to be copying the West. All the ugly, dirty, demonic thing from the West is what we're excited about. But the good thing from the West we should be learning, we don't learn, we don't learn the discipline, we don't learn our timing, we don't learn how to be courteous, we don't learn how to speak well, rather we want to pick all the evil things. And look at our students today. Even the language that is spoken, you see a student who has finished his master's degree and cannot write basic English. When you read the English that they write, you wonder how they got there. So I think when it comes to the moral thing, it's also spiritual. Mm. It's very, very, very spiritual. Our morality is so spiritual. If you don't take care, the, the nation is sinking. And trust me, that countries that are, are, are hearing it, if you go to Singapore and even Korea, there are certain things we accept here in Ghana that they don't accept there. Discipline is broken. Ethics are gone. The ethics are gone. The ethics for journalists today is zero. And it's a shame that people who are supposed to be educating us, journalism, ethic is zero. The ethic for the doctor, medical doctor, is zero. The ethic for the lawyer is zero. The politician's ethic is zero, zero, zero. In fact, minus, minus, minus zero. Unfortunately for us, 
with the cleric, cleric to have entered into it. And so we need to wake up and not play lip services on the issue of molarity. Sheikh, you couldn't have brought in a powerful thing like this. We are playing games with it. And Tema, people wrote good speeches to go and speak at the conference to let people see how eloquent and smart they are. But whether the speakers believe in what they said. Maybe I should be saying apologies to anybody who went in a genuine mind. But I don't think I owe any of them apology. Because sometimes we even, and I'll, maybe there are a few commendations that some of us will give that next time we should also get a choice of speakers that will speak their mind. Otherwise, we can bring big names. And the big names will only give us what we have. So, so people went and they showed their ambition, their greatness and things. But there are people down there, trust me, there are some imams down there, there are some pastors down there, there are some people, ordinary people down there, who can speak into people's life. Otherwise, we allow the big names to still tell us the jargons they know. And people want to speak a lot of jargons there. I listen to some of the stuff. I know the intention of the Church of Pentecost was to break down that chain of dividends of moral ethics. But some people did not go to do that. They want to speak politics. And I think that is where, as a nation, we should wake up. If we don't take care, and we politicize everything. A lot of things are happening in the sub-region today. And we seem to be closing a blind eye to it. But there must be a wake-up call to all of us that nobody is safe. Nobody is safe at all. We must wake up so we don't get any mad person to do any mad thing. Morally, the nation is going down and we all have a collective responsibility. Sheikh, reverends, imams, bishops should come together in what I call a massive united front to kill this counter. Otherwise, we will have ourselves to be blamed. Ha! Huh. What a... A whole lot of information we've had to unpack today. If you don't feel chastised for anything that you're doing that you know is immoral, because if, if Christians believe you have the Spirit of God, you know when you're, you're doing something wrong. So if you have that training, you will know if you're doing something wrong. Thank you, Reverend and Sheikh, for bringing those issues to our attention. The newspapers are also having a say on various issues. We'll start with the Ghanaian Times talking about the transatlantic slave trade and the president is asking pay us repatriation for atrocities. President demands urges Africa to resist any form of enslavement and oppression. UCC honors Dr. Prempe six others for contribution to humanity. Loss incurred in 2022 due to DDEP Bank of Ghana Governor Dr. Ernest Addison pictured with that story of course the BOG reported a 60 billion Ghana City loss, and it's become very, very topical in recent times. Um, more on the front page of the Daily Graphic, IMF bailout government meets second release conditions. Also talking about the slave trade reparations, AU approves Ghana conference. GCB Bank at 70, Testament of Banking Leadership Bank of Ghana, photograph of that group there, including Finance Minister Ken Oforiata and uh, Mr. Jude Arthur, board chairman, GC Bank, PLC, and others on the front page of the Daily Graphic. Gifty Afenidazi calls for law to sanitize media space also in the Daily Graphic. The finder, business finder talks about also the GCB Bank um, at 70 Mata, and it says GCB Bank to support Ghanaian businesses to explore beyond our uh, shores, Ghana to End use of fossil fuel cars by 2070. My sound far away, but conversations about climate change and sustainability, green energy, dominating those conversations. There is Solar Africa measure to unlock sustainable access to power. Also in the business finder. The business analyst, our next paper, EC Boss joins ECOWAS AU pre-electoral fact-finding mission to Liberia. Kesho Guru Mukadas on special prosecutors radar. So there is a foreign national who the OSP is eyeing for some crimes or alleged crimes. Fallout from pack sitting cocoa board sets record straight on forensic audit report on the cocoa roads project. Maslock fails to recover thirty point three hundred and four point three million Ghana City loans 
to customers. So more losses, the Auditor General report is what we are finding this from. So Maslock has some questions to answer. Gimpa PMI Ghana signed MOU to facilitate academia and industry transition. And GIPC paid um, 244,800 to board members without finance minister's approval. So GNPC, GIPC having some questions to answer with that. This week, the finance minister delivered the media budget review in parliament. So all those topics on our minds this morning as we discuss the stories making the headlines. Um, Sheikh, so slave trade, a lot of people say, well, this perhaps we should put it behind us and move on and begin to make better choices for ourselves, you know, manage our natural resources and our finances a bit better so that we can actually catch up with the, the, the side of the world that are actually doing better. But the president and other people also believe that we have to be paid something to compensate us for the sheer wealth of resources that were taken from the continent. What do you think? Yeah. This uh, request or ask for, for reparation and other things, I, th I think it's, it's not a new uh, subject. In, uh, during the organization of the Panafest and all that other things where, where the African Americans were brought down here in their huge, huge numbers, um, we have spoken about, about, about it um, a lot. But if that demand could come to reality, I'm sure by, by now it would have been established. So, so yes, I mean, it's good that it's been mentioned. Uh, we think that as a continent, we have not been treated well, because sometimes we are also, we are also complicit in, in this whole slave trade, slave trade uh, uh, thing. But our continent suffered heavily. Uh, our continent was devastated. Some of the, uh, the human um, resource and the capabilities that could have been used to build our nation were all carried, carried away. And look at the the, the, the number the numbers of Africans that had to work in plantations and build other nations that have become great today. So if they fleeced us and they had to build on the nation on our sweat, it is not out of place to say that look, now that we are all working on the trajectory of justice and it become more conscious of that look, you have to really restore justice. Uh, that's something we call restorative justice. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, rather than retributive justice. If we had the power, I would say we'll do reproductive so that we go back there and go and do what we have to do, but we don't have that. So conscience will tell them over there who are still manipulating us with the complicity of some of our, of, of our leaders. So tell them that something needs to be done. But I also agree with the, the fact that up to when do we have to wait for these people to come and give us reparation? And to we ourselves, even as Africans, for example, doing a lot of damage to our, to our own selves. How are we managing our, our resources our, ourselves? We just spoke about how, how we ourselves, you know, uh, fleecing our own, own, own nation. African, most African leaders have become so selfish in themselves, manipulating constitutions where they need to um, get out of power. They manipulate in order to extend their stay and causing coup d'etats and so on and so, and so forth and drawing back the wheel of progress in our country. We ourselves are now. So I think that up to, up to a point, uh, we need to sit up because the more in depth that we are becoming, the more the, the more bonded we become. In fact, we are put in a state of bondage. In fact, you, you can help me. I mean, the the governor, the first governor of Bank of Ghana, in his presentation, he made quotations from from the Bible that when you when you when you take the loan, you see, you yeah, become a slave yes, too. Yes. Huh? Like in the circumstances we have, we are finding ourselves now. So some external forces will have to even determine how we spend. We have lost our independence. You know, so I think the onus is on us. And I agree with those who said, uh, let's look at ourselves and do the needful. Plan very well. Be visionary. Be ethical in the way we manage our scarce resources. Um, let's look at the issue of industrialization our God-given natural resources. Africa is the most endowed of the continents. And yet the poorest continent. And the poorest. You see, the paradox and the irony is so distressing. I can't understand. In a situation of plenty, we are poor. Congo, Congo, Congo dear Congo alone, the minerals. So how is, why is Congo so poor? Why have they been so devastated by, by internal strife? Huh? 
and they are unable to make any anything good about about themselves why are we in a, in a country from 57 to this time i can't i can't accept i can't accept why we have to go to imf this is 17th time look let's know anybody make any justification Oh, this one is taking pride. Oh, we said we didn't go. You, you went. Uh, I mean, you, you, you said you not go, but you have gone again. You, you said you didn't go. You have no. You have gone, gone again. But why did you also go? What was the circumstance? And it didn't begin with NDC MPP from '57. They are saying that they are saying that this is the 17th time. I think our politicians must rather pay attention to that, not these accusations. Why they must really answer the question? Why? Governments before them had to go to IMF, not them, before them. So they must analyze and bring all the economies together and say what, what happened. So I think the issue is now looking into ourselves and be focused and get the direction of our development clear. Our vision must be, must be well stated and we must be realistic in the way that we do it. But our reparation, it's good to mention it, it's good to mention it. Maybe one day, 100 years after we are no more, somebody will come and then get it done. But for now, uh, it's better to focus on ourselves. The Ghanaian the, Times carried the story on page 13. I'll okay. give a few details before you, you um, share your thoughts, Reverend. So the president asking for uh, justifying the need for reparation for the atrocities and barbarism of the transatlantic slave trade, which resulted in the transportation of a number of people from the African continent to the Americas and the Caribbean. Ghana, he said, had been given the honor by the African Union to organize a conference in October, which will bring together Africans all over the world to reflect and push forward the demand for reparation. And there's a quote attributed to the president, if people could be compensated for the Holocaust, then Africans can be compensated for slavery. He was speaking at a Deborah of Chiefs held to mark this year's Emancipation Day celebration at Asin Manso in the central region. Reverend, what are your thoughts? Of course, the Daily Graphic also carried the story um, on the reparations and the AU approving Ghana for that October conference. Tell me, Bob Mali said emancipation for mental slavery. And when the African Americans gathered, they sang a song, We shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe that we shall overcome someday. I feel very emotional this morning about this. Have issue. we overcome? Mm -hmm. That is a question. How did the Jews got their reparation? How was Holocaust victims helped out and compensated? And what is taking African Americans or African Europeans or African men worldwide being left out? For those of us, the three of us here who have had a chance to be in America, be in England, be in Europe, all the infrastructures we see were built by the sweat of our forefathers. And hear me, Tama, human capital is the most essential capital you can ever get. It was taken from us. I believe we've not come together enough. The African leadership, and I agree with Sheikh, selfishness of our leaders is what is still holding us back. Trust me, when they go to the year meeting, when they go to all those meetings, what, how do they, why don't they make a serious case? You know, I'm happy that President Nanado has made this statement. But is that the first time? Yeah. This is not the first time. Yeah. Repression is not the first yeah. time. So what that's what I keep saying that we must learn to walk the talk. It must be strong enough for the world at large. And trust me, all these monies, spillovers and crumbs they send to us as IMF help and IBRD help and World Bank help are the sweat of our forefathers. The resources come from here. In fact, I am against the reason that Africa is the poorest nation. In fact, we are the richest. Well, like he rightly said, if you look at, there is no mineral resource you wonder you don't have in Congo, Kinshasa. I go there a lot. The mobile phone we use today, 
the chips that make the mobile phone is only produced in Congo Democratic Republic. It's more valuable than gold. It's more valuable than diamond. And yes, sir, we've been divided. We've so, seen the, the mines yes. where the, the, a, a lot of the people who work there, yeah. even children, we mm. see the conditions under which exactly. they work. Poor. And yet the, the, the mineral that they, they sell they from is yes. so expensive. So I think that we must be very, very vigilant and come back to the drawing board. And African leaders of all shape must come together to seek for what rightly belongs to us. This issue of reparation, we are lip servicing on it, and we are talking jargons on it. And I keep saying this, that it's not how eloquent the language is, but whether it has an impact, we are losing it. Does and Africa have the power to take a strong stand yes. against the West and say, pay us or else? Yes. Uh, Reverend, <clears throat> the Potentially, yes, but in reality, no. Look, African leaders hmm. have had to travel to, to Russia to go and talk about the supply of grains. Hmm. Yes. I was, I was shocked in my marrow <laughs> that our concern is that just two countries in the world, two, are in conflict and they are the producers of what we need by way of grains. Two. In fact, my geography is weak. I don't know how many countries do you have in the world? About 190. <laughs> yes. There 90, yes. <laughs> and out of this huge number, two countries outside of Africa mm -hmm. are in charge of our grains. Mm -hmm. And once they are in war and they cannot more produce or we cannot have a, a free flow, and deep problem. We are in deep crisis. But look at our land. Who can tell me that African land is not fertile? Why can't we produce? So in Africa, we cannot produce wheat. In Africa, we cannot produce right, rice. So once you close the door to, the, to the, 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 the import of this, we are doomed. You see, so it all comes back to how can we really African, African uh, leaders really, really come together in the true sense what are the AU? I mean, we are here, we are here, went through NATO. Uh, I, I keep on bringing this because I, I, it's, it's painful to me that Gaddafi's country. I was going to talk about him. I was going to bring this to talk about Gaddafi. African leaders were silent. This is a country that was making, making, providing adequately for its citizens. Yes, Gaddafi might have his own issues, all right. But, but Libyans were better off in terms of the free medical care, education, accommodation. Look at in our country. What is the housing situation? The old project presented by the former government is there. Is a lot of issues about it is there. And for how many years now? We have not been able to find answer to it. Six years or seven years. The government just um, cut sword for construction yes, of 8,000 yes, units. Yeah, so it is also part of the... Even, uh, exactly. Once we have <coughs> more, it is, it is the best, you know. But what, why are we doing this to ourselves? In a country where these things are made available, I mean, these same people came, influenced, incited this, the Libyans, they went against their own leader, and killed him in the most disgraceful manner that you cannot find a place now where you can know that this is where Gaddafi was, was buried. You can't. What has he done? Do those to an African leader using the African hand to do this to our, our own kind? You know? So, these issues, and I think that the potential for us to rise and become great, and uh, the human resource that he was talking about, Sheikh Ante Diop and others, um, great minds that have come from Africa are evidence of the of how the heights that we can rise up to but that is talking history if history does not guide what is the use of history if history cannot guide you to understand the past analyze the present and project into the future then history has no value so so the history of africa itself must be a guide you know 
for us so that when we are talking about this reparation let's analyze ourselves and look at ourselves now very well and see what heritage we want to leave for for the, the future but i'm i'm worried in terms of our african independence in the light of the fact that we are unable to produce our grain and ukraine and russia alone are in war in this country in, in this world out of 190 something countries only two countries and Africa there, there, has to there travel is conflict. To, to Russia. There is conflict in, in, in some parts of Africa. And there are coups. It's almost as if Northern Africa and the South has been cut off. Because there's a middle belt that has coups back to back to back all the way the, to the, the, the other the side. And let's not also lose sight of the fact that Niger's coup, for example, has direct implications on onion supplies in Ghana. So the fears of shortages... Um, when conflicts arise across, you know, the, the, the world, because now we are a global village, cannot be glossed over. Tell so, me, ECOWAS has a responsibility. I don't think ECOWAS is really standing up to his responsibility. I know the head of ECOWAS now is the Nigerian president. Mm. But we seem to be playing games with these issues that are very dangerous. You know, sometimes when we sit here, what we say, we should be very mindful so it won't look as if we are inciting people. But it's happened in Mali. It's happened in Burkina Faso. It's happened in Niger. That's what happened in Guinea. Yeah, that line. At that belt, we should not take it for granted. And it should also look as if the Anglophones are just taking a stand and they are protecting their own. If it happens to one, it has happened to all of us. Certainly what is happening now is that it's a direct confrontation between Niger and some of them in France and what is ECOWAS doing? I think ECOWAS is not just a dialogue. We should be able to implement, implement some of the dialogues we do and that is my biggest concern with mm -hmm. ECOWAS. Something is not right. And we are not Thema, we are not safe at all. We are not safe. When people get up, if we get one mad person, it can cause a lot of problems. And we don't want to go back to where we are coming from again. Nobody is safe. And nobody should sit down and take things for granted. Like Mordecai sent a message to Esther. If you don't go and it happened, it will happen to all of us. Somebody must wake up. I'm believing God that one African leader would dare to be different. One African leader would dare to call a spade a spade. One African leader and would not just go and go and show uh, 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 how eloquent and how smart we are and how secure we are, but how we can take a decision that will turn the straight. ECOWAS is sinking. ECOWAS is sinking. And this is serious. These two serious that you can imagine. And people are playing diplomacy over it. Listen to me. It is diplomacy broken down that affected Ukraine and Russia. What happened between Ukraine and Russia could have been savage. Remember, Ukraine and Russia is like Aquapim and Fanti. They virtually, the language is language. very close to themselves. <clears throat> Besides that, they are the same people. And what has brought the tension there? Who is celebrating in the tension between Ukraine and Russia? These are unanswered questions. But whether we like it or not, this is diplomacy broken down. This war is needless. Unless somebody is enjoying and benefiting from this war, the war between Ukraine and Russia is certainly needless. Don't forget that there used to be one people. It's needless. And I studied in Eastern Europe. So sometimes our comments, we, we leave it now because then it will look as if we are inside the temple. But this war is needless. It could have been avoided. And can you imagine how long the war is taking? Why do you think it's taking that long? Because there are certain interest places for certain people that every now and then you have to go and bomb certain places. Because war is also business yes. for some. Yes, it is. Yeah. It? So some and people... so some people are benefiting from this war. The divide and rule that happens in Africa, some people are benefiting it. Who sends the weapon to, to uh, 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 Congo Kinshasa? Who sends the weapon to Burkina Faso? Who are the people? How did we lose Kwame Nkrumah? How did we lose our leaders? So, some of these things, we, as a student of international relations, we sit back sometimes, we look at it, and let's analyze things scientifically. Echo us, wake up, we shouldn't sleep. This is the current situation of Africa. This is it. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing the countries in red. Mm -hmm. 
that are currently going through instability. Guinea in West Africa, Mali in West Africa, Burkina Faso in West Africa, mm. Niger in West Africa. Then we get Chad and Sudan. And look at the belt. Yeah. So it's like the north has been separated yeah. from parts of Central and Southern Africa. And it's a strategy. And more of those countries, one, two, three, four of those six countries are in West Africa. Mm -hmm. Tells us that we should not, like you said, take anything for granted. Credit to Daily Trust for putting this visual together. So conversations around reparations, what are we doing to build ourselves? Also continuing, you should join our chat 055 on our WhatsApp number. Um, other stories making the headlines today. The Bank of Ghana is having to defend the loss of 60 billion recently. And they told us at a press conference yesterday that the loss was incurred due to the domestic debt exchange program. So um, uh, the, the losses were incurred in the year 2020. And we are told it's the DDEP and not mismanagement. The director of research of Bank of Ghana, Dr. Philip Ab Abradu, Otu told journalists at a press conference yesterday that the BOG had to suffer haircuts to keep the economy running. And so they called the conference to explain the lost BOG incurred in 2022, which was captured in the 2022 annual report and financial statement of the BOG. And they stated that the bank incurred about 55.12 billion Ghana cities, partly due to the DDEP. And they said that they spent 131 million Ghana cities on vehicle maintenance and that the BOG took 50% haircut to help the country seal the IMF deal quickly and send signal to Ghana's bilateral creditors to support the country's move to overcome its debt challenges. So it, um, there's a quote, the, the BOG has been the shock absorber of the DDEP and suffered the biggest hit. We want to understand what these um, mean in detail. So, Reverend and Sheikh, um, I'll go over to an analyst who will be helping us to understand all this. Dr. Amwa from the, a senior lecturer at the Department of Finance at the University of Ghana Business School. Dr. Benjamin Amwa has joined us. Doc, thank you for making the time. Um, the BOG told us that it has lost that 60 billion and now it's explaining how it incurred those losses. It's telling us that it got 55 plus billion because of the DDEP. What does this mean for the country, even though the bank insists that it is still solvent and able to keep us afloat? Thank you very much and good morning to the viewers. First of all, we need to appreciate the functions and purpose of the central bank. And that is enshrining Act 612 and then Act 673. That specifies exactly what the central bank, that is Bank of Ghana, must do in terms of its functions. If you look at what has happened in terms of the losses that Bank of Ghana has suffered, the 62 or so billion cities that are talking about, the question we need to ask ourselves is to what extent does the 62 billion cities loss impact on Bank of Ghana's ability to perform its functions as stated in Act 612 and then Act 673. Why am I saying so? I'm saying so because the 62 billion that we are talking about now is what we call a low frequency, high impact event that took place last year, where all the financial institutions have suffered some form of losses because of the government decision to go through the domestic debt exchange program. So BOG's losses is not what I would call uh, a running losses or a running loss that has occurred over time. This huge loss is attributable to the DDEP. Now, we need to ask to what extent will it impact on the functions of Bank of Ghana? If you look at what has happened, it is more of a paper to paper, what's paper to paper cancellation or reduction in the asset pool of Bank of Ghana in the form of the domestic debt program and the Ministry of Finance indebtedness to Bank of Ghana. 
So what has actually happened is that the Ministry of Finance has reduced the value of investment that Bank of Ghana held in the bonds that Bank of Ghana purchased from Ministry of Finance. When Bank of Ghana was purchasing these bonds, Bank of Ghana paid Ministry of Finance some money over time for these bonds. The bond indenture or the document that specifies what the funds will have been used for specified also the frequency of repayment from the Ministry of Finance. Now that the government or the Ministry of Finance says that we cannot pay because of the challenges we are having, the Bank of Ghana must prudentially reduce its assets by that amount. And reducing its assets, the losses that will be incurred is what the Bank of Ghana has recognized through its income leading to the loss. So the implication now is that Bank of Ghana's ability to supervise the financial services sector, to regulate and then license the financial institutions that we have, the deputy taking financial institutions, that has not been hampered as a result of this loss. What we can ask is, what did the Ministry of Finance do with all these funds? And how come we are in this difficulty? That is a question that Ministry of Finance must answer. But for Bank of Ghana, they are personally solvent. They can still, they are personally okay, and they can still go ahead and do their core business as enshrining at 612 and then 673. Again, we should not forget that the central bank is set up not to make profit. That is what we need to be aware of. The central bank is set up to be self-sufficient, mobilized enough, run yourself in terms of operations, and then if there are surpluses, the surpluses goes to the state, which is the government. If there are no surpluses, and of course, if you look around the world, for about 10 years now, many central banks around the world have suffered this type of losses simply because of the challenges that the world has gone through. And so it is not too peculiar in our case. But in our case, the amount is huge, and it is so huge because it is because of the domestic debt exchange program. So to the regular um, Joe, the man on the streets, does it mean government borrowed from the Bank of Ghana and that is what led to the most part of these um, losses that they announced? Absolutely. When the Ministry of Finance issued the bonds, indirectly the Ministry of Finance is borrowing from the individual institutions that participate or by purchasing the bonds. So indeed, Ministry of Finance or the Treasury borrowed from Bank of Ghana. And when they borrowed, they were expected to repay. But what is happening now is that Ministry of Finance, in plain language, is telling Bank of Ghana that we cannot pay how much, the, the sum that we are owing you. So we are restructuring it. And we are reducing how much you gave us. And if that is happening, that means that Bank of Ghana must go back and then reconcile it books. And reconciling it books, all the differences, the reduction in what was initially expected to be paid to Bank of Ghana must now be recognized as a loss. And that is what Bank of Ghana has recognized in its annual report as a loss that we are all seeing. Again, we should be aware that in all instances, the central government hardly pays its indebtedness to the central bank. It hardly happens. So what will happen is that Bank of Ghana could have kept those instruments on its statement, still maintaining that the Ministry of Finance owes Bank of Ghana X amount of money. But the reality is that it will never be paid. So what do you do? You better, from the prudential point of view, take it out of your books so that you can have a clean sheet and then start with And that is what Bank of Ghana has done. So it's a debt Ex forgiveness. Uh, it's just, it's, yeah, that's a nice term. Uh, sure, you can call it debt forgiveness. Yes, but it is coming at a cost to us because what it means is that the Ministry of Finance will borrow from Bank of Ghana. The Ministry of Finance under all they should have paid back. But that money is no longer being paid. That is a loss. Again, we should also understand that the central bank is owned by the state. And the Ministry of Finance is also an arm or an agency of the state. So the question then is, if even Ministry of Finance had paid Bank of Ghana, that money would have gone to Bank of Ghana as repayment, 
At the end of the year, Bank of Ghana will still have sent that money back to Ministry of Finance. So there is that circular flow of funds that always goes between the ministry and the central bank. Anytime the ministry borrows from the central bank, it is said that the money will be moving in a circular manner. It goes to Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Finance to Bank of Ghana, Bank of Ghana to Ministry of Finance, and it moves on like that because the owner of the central bank is the state. So that is how it is. So now that they have written that off, technically speaking, it doesn't mean anything at all. Because what it means is that what should have been paid by the Ministry of Finance that will go to Bank of Ghana. Because for Bank of Ghana, if you now move to Ministry of Finance again, that you come to Bank of Ghana again has been cut off. That is what is happening. And that is where we are now. The question is, what were the funds used for? That is what we need to be asking. And then two, to answer that, then we have to go and look for the bond in data. When you are issuing bonds, you come up with what you call a document. A document will stipulate what you are going to use the money for. So we need to match all that number of bonds that Bank of Ghana bought for Ministry of Finance. And then go and look for the supporting bond indenture. And then ask to know whether Ministry of Finance indeed used the funds it's borrowed from Bank of Ghana for the purpose. If it has been done and then we can have value for money for that particular funds borrowed from uh, Bank of Ghana, then I think we don't have much to say. But then if we cannot answer that, then we have a lot of questions to ask. Because if we don't do that, then it can become a channel where the ministry will go to Bank of Ghana, sell these bonds to Bank of Ghana, get the money, and then in using the money, accountability becomes a problem. Considering what we've been through with the financial sector cleanup and the trust and confidence that people have in the banks following the volatilities that we witnessed a couple of years ago, what does this say and how does it affect the depositors who have kept monies and bought bonds from the Bank of Ghana and they are not getting some of those monies back? Thank you very much. In the first place, these bonds were issued by Ministry of Finance. That is what's called the Treasury on behalf of government to finance budget deficit. Now, what Bank of Ghana will do in this place is that Bank of Ghana will provide the account holding service because the Ministry of Finance does not operate account holding services. So they cannot go and more or less collect the money from the public. So Bank of Ghana will come in between the Ministry of Finance and the public. So the instruments that were issued were not issued by Bank of Ghana. They were issued by Ministry of Finance. That is why those who are picketing, that is why those who are complaining are complaining against the Ministry of Finance and not the Bank of Ghana. Now, what it means for the entire uh, financial or deposit taking industry space is that it means seriously nothing in terms of what has happened to Bank of Ghana, not the other uh, bond purchases who have suffered loss. I'm talking strictly in terms of Bank of Ghana. It means nothing in the sense that for a typical central bank, you cannot apply in strict sense the international financial reporting standard to a typical central bank. You can rather do selective application because the central bank itself is sovereign. The central bank is close with the power of sovereignty. And within that sovereignty, the central bank can decide that when it comes to capital, it will run on negative equity. And that is what is happening now. What is happening now is that these losses that the central bank has suffered has affected the equity position of the central bank. So you hear the issue of recapitalization. You don't necessarily have to recapitalize the central bank. No. The central bank can still operate with a negative capitalization. It is not a commercial bank that mobilizes deposits from the public. If it has mobilized deposits from the public, that is where we're talking about the issue of capital. But now, because it is sovereign, even with the negative capitalization, Bank of Ghana can still go ahead and do its business. The only thing is that we want to look at the book and say, ah, why is it that the central bank has a negative capitalization? Does it bring some level of confidence or credibility? That is the only issue. But apart from that, there are lots of central banks that have run on negative equity. They are some that are running on negative equity simply because of how the central bank is positioned within the economy. And so when, when we are told they have to that go this... and enforce international financial reporting standards, but that street enforcement does not operate in the world of central banking. So yes, I, the I, I want to understand something, something else. So when we are told that this um, 
you know, taking one for the team, so to speak, by the Bank of Ghana, helped us to get the IMF deal. You are mentioning credibility issues, and yet we are told that it's one of the, the things that um, helped pave the way for us to get the, the, the bailout agreement that we, we, we are into right now. The, the second uh, part of which we are told that we are going to get, government has told us that it has met the, the conditions for the release of the second tranche of funds. What, what, what are the credibility issues here, if you're saying that the credibility is in doubt? Okay, the credibility becomes, like I said, becomes in doubt when you look at the book of the central bank, you see a negative equity. So the question is, how can you run a business and then the owner's stake in the business is negative? It, it's negative. It doesn't, it doesn't really, really, you know, call you know, and bring about some credibility. But then, see, what the central bank did was that the fiscal, what you call the Ministry of Finance, needed, because of budget deficit, needed to go through the debt restructuring. And in doing that, all the creditors that the Ministry of Finance owed, including the central bank, had to sacrifice. Mm. And if you look at the pool of creditors who purchased the bonds from the Ministry of Finance, Bank of Ghana holds a chunk in it. I get me. So if Bank of Ghana holds a chunk in it, and we should not forget, the owner of Bank of Ghana is the state called Ghana, mm. right. ruled by a group called government. Mm. So if the government has issued securities that its own, you can call it its own uh, leg or ear or nose, sorry to say, has bought part of the instrument, that is Bank of Ghana. And then the state council says, okay, fine, I'm in difficulty. I will not be able to pay you. The nose or the leg can say that, hey, it doesn't matter. Whatever you are indebted to me, let's allow it to go. So that we can have the needed physical space to deal with the external body called IMF. So just like individuals were told to also share in the burden, banks were told to share the burden, the Bank of Ghana could not have in this situation refused to take part in the burden share because one, it is owned by the state and it is for the state. Two, the state needs money at this point in time. So Bank of Ghana cannot take itself up when all other entities are sacrificing. So Bank of Ghana has to come to in say... and then sacrifice so that the state Ghana can have its approval from IMF to go through this particular uh, program. And that is where the credibility comes from. So now that Bank of Ghana has waived off some of its interest in the bond, there is enough room now for the government to benefit from that decision. So it's safe to say that Ghana lost 60 billion as its own haircut in the DDEP? Absolutely. Ghana lost 60 billion. Yes, that is Ghana. Yes, through the Ministry of Finance. Again, it will be difficult for the central bank to have opted out of this. It, it will never work. The central bank will never, because see, the central bank was created by the state to the constitution for the state together with the Ministry of Finance. So whatever this, it's like the left arm and the right arm. Mm. You cannot take advantage of each other. You have to work in perfect sync, the monetary and the physical side. But the only challenge is that sometimes the politicians tend to abuse the physical space. That is where the problem is. Dr. That Amor, is where the, yeah. I think this is all time will permit us to get into. Perhaps we'll have you on another time to explain some more things to us on Thank GTV you. Breakfast. Very grateful for your company. Dr. Benjamin Amo is a senior lecturer at the Department of Finance at the University of Ghana Business School, helping us understand what the Bank of Ghana 60 billion Ghana City loss means for the central bank, the government itself, and for other deposit taking institutions. In the meantime, we are told that the government has met the conditions for this second release of the IMF funds, and we are told that a comprehensive stock taking of payables accumulated by all. MDA is designed a payable clearance plan and laid out a structural reform plan to reduce future accumulation of arrears. So another tranche of funds is expected from the IMF as the country has met the benchmarks commonly referred to as conditionalities, which include um, you know, putting all these comprehensive stock taking and payment areas into consideration. The Daily Graphic carries that story on page 16. Reverend and Sheikh, I'll take your quick thoughts on this subject and then we'll get some messages from our screens. The analyst, the, the um, doctor from the University of Ghana Business School has told us, in fact, that 
um, government said everyone should take, you know, a, a bit of the of the heat so that we can get the IMF bill out. It cost us sixty billion Ghana cities to, you know, put ourselves in a place where the IMF hopes or is trusting of our ability to pay back the loan. What are your thoughts? Tom, I've always believed that credibility is very important. The credibility of the Bank of Ghana and the Ministry of Finance is very, very crucial. Our central bank should not just bring us subjects that will make us doubt their strength and their energy. Remember, the nation has gone through some financial exercises. And there are people who have been bruised, there are people who are still hurting, there are people who are still in pain, there are people who are in serious debt. Some have lost their businesses. Some um, mini banks and mini, uh, what do you even call them, uh, um, small banking systems have all been closed down. So if the Bank of Ghana is coming out, they must come out clear. Then also, this issue of, I keep saying that, we shouldn't use jargon to explain things. Break it to the ordinary man on the street. There are people whose monies have been locked up. We must make sure that they understand what the system is. And don't forget that this money we are talking about from IMF, we are paying back. And so if already certain junks are going out of it, we are not safe. In the, as all this is going on, food prices are still rather high and food price topics continue to dominate conversations. There's a story on page 36 of the Daily Graphic which is talking about enforcing system compliance to tackle unfair food prices. You buy one item from point A and you buy it for an entirely different price at point B. So what are the, the mechanisms that are protecting the consumer from some of these unfair trade practices? All those come to bear when we talk about money issues and how much we are losing as a country. Sheikh, what are your thoughts? I'm going to go over to the screen, 0555-61034, to pick your thoughts. Sheikh, what do you think? I think I look at the whole thing as, as to, to, in, the, in, this, in the context that the price we have to, we have to pay in order, in, order, in order to be respected and to be concerned by the, by the IMF. And that has been described in terms of the loss um, that um, we, we, we have incurred. Um, uh, uh, currently, but the good thing is that yesterday I, I was at a function where the Honorable Finance Minister was there and uh, as, a, as a guest of honor. And in the present, in presentation he made, I mean, he uses expressions like, well, in, in terms of our economy, he said we have been bruised, we have been battered, we have been, I mean, he was describing. <laughs> very descriptive. <laughs> very descriptive, uh, you know, uh, acknowledging that, I mean, something. Uh, did not go well and uh, we are in a certain situation of distress we are suffering and so on and so forth so so if the the process that will lead to us getting the loan that will bring us some relief and to reorganize ourselves if that is the way to go and then we ought to have to all have to engage in this kind of sacrifices then I mean why not that is it when which we are like we are in the same boat uh, and somebody is saying that the water is coming to the boat. It's sinking. They say, yeah, I'm going I'm going I'm going I'm going to inform you. I'm I'm going to inform you. Say, say, I'm going And then the, the boat is sinking. Uh -huh. You'll no, sink with the boat. The old one. You know, you know, so, so it's, if you want to put it in this kind of uh, description, then that's the street in which we find uh, ourselves. That's our reality, and we accept that uh, the Bank of Ghana, I think I like uh, Reverend's point that, you see, for the ordinary person, we need to really break down this for our understanding. Once we don't understand it, to the ordinary Ghanaian, oh! 60 billion. 60 billion! Yo! 60 billion! What does it mean that that 60 billion is it that some money was sitting somewhere and it lost it uh -huh, and so on and so forth so i i think i think the communication need to be improved uh, bank of ghana can break it down to the ordinary Ghanaians level so that when our sacrifices are demanded for example everybody will prepare based on understanding to say look let me also help mm -hmm. The finance minister presented the media budget to be in parliament on Monday and the majority and minority sides, of, of course, um, widely expected to disagree, ended up disagreeing to whether we are actually turning the corner, which is what the government side believes, or whether 
uh, woes are deepening, which is what the minority sides believe. Perhaps we'll pick a few thoughts on that. But whilst we wait for that to happen, let's focus on some um, issues to do with the media. The Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association are um, suing the Ministry of Communication and Digitalization um, for charging contribution link fees without any legal basis or parliamentary approval. We have um, Mr. Cecil Thomas Nilante Sunkwa Mills, the president of the Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association, on the line to help us understand why they've resorted to this um, means of registering their, their displeasure or disagreement with that um, directive or with that uh, imposition of the fee. Um, sir, good morning. Thank you for making time to join us on GTV Breakfast. What, what, what okay. exactly does it mean when the the at least the communication that your, your outfit sent was that the ministry is charging contribution link fees. What does contribution link fee mean? Uh, thank you and good morning uh, to all the listeners. So um, the Ghana Protesters uh, Association, uh, we have actually, we have sued the ministry and um, our claim, uh, actually there are four claims, four main claims. I'll just quickly go through that. The first one is a declaration that the decision for the ministry. If you could speak up a bit for me, Mr. Sunkwa Mills, I can barely hear you. Please go ahead. Is this better? Yes, please Hello. go ahead. Is this better? Can you hear me? Yes, it is. It's much better. Thank okay. you. So the first one is the declaration that the decision of the Ministry of Communications and Digitalization and Establishing Fees for Contribution Link Services is null and void. So this is one. One is Contribution Link Services. Two, a declaration that the Ministry, the same Ministry, uh, is taking a decision to establish TV channel fees is null and void for want of parliamentary approval of the said fees. So that remember this contribution link and then the TV channel fee. And then the third one, the declaration that the authority granted uh, the second defense, which is KNET, um, which is a private entity, to collect fees for contribution link services by the Ministry of Communications and to disconnect broadcasters that do not pay the same as now. And the third one is to Question the decision of the Ministry of Communications and Digitalization authorizing the disconnection of broadcasts from the DTT transmissions platform on account of non payment of the fee charge for contribution link services and TV channel fees. So these are the main four. Any others that the court may uh, deem, deem uh, right. Now, we contribution fees. Um, in the design of the DTT network across Ghana, there are two legs that the station uh, sends their signal to people's televisions. The first leg is from the studio to a point of aggregation that we call head end. So all stations that were authorized to operate on the DTT platform by the NCA received a letter which specifically put the responsibility of delivery of their signal to the head end uh, on uh, it must be um, by the station is the station's responsibility so that is the story and that is the, what we has been termed as, as contribution link services however this service this 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 link has um, now uh, been Allocated, allegedly allocated to, K, to KNET uh, by the ministry, and this was uh, confirmed in a written directive from the ministry, and asked them to collect the money, which was in 20 from 2020, when KNET started asking stations to pay this fee. Originally, this fee, um, when DTT started, there was no fee as such. The government in a discussion with stations, the 15 analog stations had decided to take uh, the, the support of sending that link from studio to head end uh, was picking up by the, the government at that time to 
enable the DTT process move quickly. Um, till this was supposed to happen till they did the digital um, um, switch over or the analog switch off. Uh, for some reason, that has not happened, and that is basically one of the jobs that the ministry has to do, and why it has not happened. But you don't know what that reason is. Well, for, for there are so many reasons. There are a number of reasons that we may know, but we don't know conclusively why there has been a long delay. Because we, as an association, for the last three years, after discussions uh, uh, we had and we had some disagreement on the policy that was uh, being used to roll out the DTT, uh, for three years we have not been communicated to by the ministry. Neither have we. They called us in for a meeting. Um, just in hindsight, we have been to the Parliamentary Select Committee twice. The last one was very recently on these contribution link services that we thought were not legit. We had a full discussion there. And um, we there was no definite conclusion from that meeting. They were supposed to come back to us uh, and, and, and we look at the issue again after the meeting. Looking at the situation, the third party, which is Kinect, had gone on. They had successfully disconnected some TV stations. So some of them paid a little bit of money so that they would have them on. This was especially during the World Cup time when they were pressurizing the stations to pay this fee, which had not been negotiated, not been discussed. And it was not the responsibility, we believe, it was not the responsibility of the ministry to mandate with a letter and give power to KNET to provide the service or and disconnect anybody who did not pay uh, that fee. We did not even know how KNET came up with fee of that magnitude. And uh, they did not, uh, there, was, there were no service level agreements to even deliver the service. So um, after that meeting, we decided uh, some stations had been put off in fact, as I speak, Kinet has disconnected some stations for nine months now who have been authorized and have paid full authorization fees to sit on the DPT platform. These stations have been disconnected because they refused to pay to the Kinet and said they will send the signal themselves after the authorization from the NCA. Now it is nine months. I don't believe our constitution uh, wanted this to happen. So we thought uh, we should seek clarification to fix this uh, through the courts of Ghana. Right. Thank you for then, making time to explain I, some of these issues to yeah. us. I, I believe that because the, the matter is in court, it will mm. uh, un, unfold mm. in a certain way. Yeah. But we'll keep, we'll keep monitoring the situation. And where we find another opportunity, we'll definitely engage you to explain definitely. certain the, things. The TV channel fees is the same thing with no mm. approval, which is a different link about Keep people signal from the head end to the TV stations. It's also another issue that has not. We don't have any clear approval from Parliament, but the stations have been invoiced to pay. Right. So that is the second one. Thank Mr. you. Mr. President, thank you so much for making time. Thomas Sunkwa Mills is the president of the Ghana Independent Broadcasters Association, speaking to us about the suit they're bringing against the Ministry of Communication and Digitalization and the service provider KNET Ghana Limited for unilaterally charging contribution links fees without any legal basis or parliamentary approval, among other things. We are monitoring that situation and we'll be able to give you a fair idea of what's happening in court by our court reporter. Connect with us, our own news channel, GBC News, will have details as and when court sits on the matter. Other stories in the newspapers, Ghana to end the use of fossil fuels by 2070. Cecilia Dapas alleged stolen money, AG to take over case. Yesterday, the court remanded the alleged thieves into um, custody, so no bail for them. They were not granted bail. Um, one of the persons who we are told was a nursing mother was unable to meet bail conditions as well, and so they all remain in prison. We've talked about the IMF bailout and government meeting the second release conditions. We've talked about slave trade reparations and the AU's approval of a conference to be held in Ghana in October. We've talked about unfair food prices, 
um, Giba has explained why they are taking the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Communications to court, the Bank of Ghana and the loss of 60 billion Ghana cities. We've also been getting some clarity on that. Our guests, Reverend and Sheikh, have been here. Reverend, I'll take your final words for this segment and then we rise for the day. That we should not take our moral ethics for granted. What Sheikh said earlier today made a lot of sense to me. We should take it very serious. The nation is sinking and we all have a collective responsibility to build Ghana. We should wake up, we should get things back there. And also, we fully recommend that the schools should go back mm. to the religious mm. institutions. Mm. That is where discipline will begin. Hand over the schools back to the churches. Yes. Sheikh. Mm. Mm. I mean, well, um, <clears throat> this whole, I mean, I, I, I'm more interested in, in that aspect, so let me end up on that note. Uh, the Church of Pentecost actually did not want to leave this thing at just a talking level. So a whole committee has been put in place, and there are different recommendations that have been suggested mm -hmm. to see what we can do to really bring some sanity into our moral, morals, so both at personal levels within public and social spaces. To ensure that, uh, we'll, and I want to encourage uh, every, I mean, citizens, that when we roll out certain programs, let's all cooperate and see what we can do to salvage the future of our country on the sound, on the firm foundation of good moral, morality and ethical foundations. Right. So I'm told that we have a, a few minutes to pick some quick, quick really quick messages so I'll be going over to the screen now perhaps I'll pick a couple because we do appreciate the time it takes you to send your thoughts to us zero five 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 six one zero three four and the first one on my screen I must say these are the thoughts of those who are sending them and not the thoughts of any of us here or GBC religious leaders are now hypocrites there are no more like the Catholic <laughs> Archbishop retired Aquisi Sapong in the 80s who stood against PNDC activities in Ghana Akazabre is sending us that wow shake your fancy is on point shake is almost he's a fancy <laughs> man <laughs> Benagre from Sakumono good morning tell me to your guest guest thank you for the illustration the map of Africa shown on your screen brings to us as people when we talk of an ocean dividing Africa into two on the social media platform this is it African un leaders must wise up thank you um Thelma tell your panel about the concerns the nation and economic growth has always been taken care of in prayers by the chief imam from the 93 days of bad times there's good news for Ghana before Christmas okay <laughs> good news for Ghana I'm looking forward to that good news from IMF more cash in town for Ghana congratulations citizens in Ghana can go for Christmas shopping. I'll hide it out that tongue in cheek for your comments there. Good morning, madam. The governor of the Bank of Ghana should be held responsible for the loss of this huge amount of money. The governor was advised to stop printing money for government, but he paid debt years to it. It's unfair the way government is treating Ghanaians. Other West African countries are going through these head cuts, but why Ghana? Other countries are doing better. Al Haji Hamza, the um, lecturer, the senior lecturer from the University of Ghana, has explained. Some of these things so perhaps let's go back and and have another look a leader makes more leaders but not followers the issue of morality is becoming an issue in this country and the country is retrogressing because they said that is the order of the day until we start doing things right like malaysia singapore and the rest then this nation shall continue to saddle or sanki day joins us i'm not holding brief or honorable cecilia the for holding such a huge sum of money in the house but i think she had the inspiration to hide the money in the house because of the number one syndrome in fact what the attorney general <laughs> should ascertain <laughs> is that the honorable woman and the husband legally or illegally acquired the money simply sita yeah or sanki day sent us that from <laughs> taifa how can you say the bank of ghana did not act recklessly to lend money indirectly to the government above a certain level bog broke its own act if what they did was right why have they now agreed with the IMF not to lend the password to the government? It's a lopsided analysis by Dr. Amoy. You should remember that some individuals and all commercial banks also have their money with the BOG. The level of increase in their operating expenses over the previous year is also worrying. Thoughts expressed by those who are watching and not the opinions of us at GBC. Good morning. The troubles of Africa is caused by Africans. What is the willpower of our leaders to resist the influence of others, other influential leaders? Our leaders mismanage our resources at the expense of the ordinary persons most of us, the ordinary people, are also not honest. We cannot be trusted with anything. In fact, let us pray for the attitudinal reformation of the Africans so that we can collectively resist any negative influence of our oppressors in order to help our continent. Imbiliba sent us this from Insawam. 
So the messages are many. I want to believe Ghanaian leaders, whether NDC or MPP, are causing severe harm to the Ghana financial sector than the countries that military have taken over. How I wish there will be a, well, we do not wish for that. So that's your opinion. Good morning, Thelma. Um, well, I don't know how, on what basis you say that. The National Development Conference communique must be implemented. We first have to feed our people, then we can insist more on morality. Rajwa, excellent Ghana <laughs> Forum from Usu, telling us that you cannot be moral if you are hungry, perhaps. <laughs> and so, those are the thoughts that you've sent to us. Thank you so much for helping us analyze the issues and for joining our quest to better understand what the issues mean. Sheikh Arimi Yao Shaibu, spokesperson for the National Chief Imam. Thank you, Sheikh, and have the very best day. Reverend Dr. Lawrence Setia, president and founder of the Worldwide Miracle Outreach. Thank you also for making time. And I wish you the very best as you go about the rest of your week and the days ahead. Reverend Travel Mercies to you as you go. Um, televangelizing. Uh, televangelism is your calling. So all the best on the next leg of your journey. And hopefully we'll see you back here again very, very shortly. The headline segment on GTV Breakfast. We'll be back with more conversations about peace after the break. <laughs>